Who cares? What does it matter? We're all gonna die. The first step is to weld a ferrule on a three inch sanitary 90. That 90 is going to slide inside this 4 inch jacket 90. Hot water is going to flow through this 90, keeping the product above a certain temperature as it flows through that 90 right there. As Corey tacks the 90 and the ferrule together, you can see that he's using short, quick tacks at low heat to avoid burning through and oxidizing the inside of that tubing. This is stainless steel sanitary tubing used in food production, and these are the ferrules used to clamp the tubing together. But why are we putting a jacket on this 90 in the first place? What kind of food requires 100% jacketed piping anyway? And what if you need a jacketed tee? How do you get a small tee to fit inside of a bigger one? More on that in a minute. These are a few jacketed fittings we've made already, and these are the ingredients that will go into the jacketed 90 you're about to see. You're going to see just under two hours of work here in the next few minutes. So you can imagine if 190 takes this long to build, how long it would take to pipe in a whole jacketed system or a whole plant. That air hose going in the left side of the tube is actually an argon purge line. When you weld stainless pipe or tubing, you want to purge with an inert gas that displaces all the oxygen inside the pipe. Otherwise, the back side of this weld would oxidize. And especially because there is food product flowing through that 3 inch tube, proper purging is key. And I'll show you the inside of this weld in a minute. When fusion welding sanitary tube, you don't really want a wide weave Rather a nice tight bead like this helps you to get good penetration without a lot of heat input. All of these parts are 304 stainless steel. You want to brush your starts and stops, otherwise you can carry some dirt in the puddle when you do the second half of your weld. The 4 inch jacket 90s have a mill finish on them, so just for the sake of aesthetics, Corey's going to give it a quick polish. And he's using a radial bristle brush from 3M on the drill. We often use these to polish stainless or take the color off of welds. The different colors you see here are different grits. The green and yellow are a similar grit. They're pretty fine. We often use them for cleaning up polished stainless. Whereas the brown wheel is a little more aggressive and we'll use that for cleaning the color off of pipe. And you can see a couple other Scotch-Brite wheels that we use occasionally. I'll go ahead and link all of these in the description down below if you're interested. Corey's going to blow some holes in the 4-inch outer jacket. The hot water will enter through the one threaded port fill up the jacket and exit through the other. We're using these carbide hole saws from Easy Arc. They are spring loaded for slug removal. They're about 20 bucks a pop and we can get quite a few holes out of one bit. I will link them down below as well. When all of these pipes and fittings are installed, there will be hose jumpers connecting each one to the next. The hot water is going to fill up one jacket, go out the exit port through the hose and into the supply port on the next piece. The hot water typically flows opposite the direction the product is flowing because the product is hottest coming out of the tank and the hot water is hottest when it comes out of the supply.
whenever you drill stainless, you want to use a low speed and about as much pressure as you can. Drilling too fast with not enough pressure means you're not really cutting, but you are heating up the stainless. If it gets too hot and starts to turn colors, it can get work hardened. And once hardened, you won't be able to drill anymore. Best to use some kind of lube or even dip your bit in water to keep it cool. Remember kids, files are directional. They always want to be pushing away from yourself. Unless of course it's someone else's file, then just do what feels right. The next step is one you don't want to forget. Be sure to slide this ring on and make sure the hole is big enough to slip over your weld. Then you're going to slide the 4 inch 90 on, followed by the other ring, before you weld the last ferrule. These rings are cut out on the burn table. You'll notice they're a little bit offset or eccentric. That's just because of the way the 3 inch 90 sits inside of the 4 inch 90. It's not quite on center. However, when we jacket straight pieces of pipe, we are able to use concentric rings. At this point, he's got all the pieces slid onto the 90, but as you can see, he's got that 4 inch jacket 90 slid back out of the way so he can weld that last 3 inch ferrule on. If he tacked the jacket together first, he would not have as much room to make this weld. The reason we don't add wire to sanitary tubing is to not risk introducing impurities to the inside of the weld. Also, it doesn't really need wire for strength. If your fit is perfect, and it should be, then there's no loss of material and your weld should be as strong as the rest of the tubing. You're about to see a weld termination or a tail off. Because we're running lift arc, he's got to feather it out gradually running faster and faster before ripping it away. That's so oxygen isn't suddenly introduced to a hot weld puddle. This is with no tail off, and this is a good tail off. Once the three inch is welded, he's gonna tack the jacket together and weld it out as well. But what kind of products use jacketed piping? There's actually a lot of them. Corn syrup is a common one, some pharmaceutical ingredients. And when I posted this on Instagram, a lot of people chimed in with places they've either seen or used jacketed piping, like in margarine and butter production, cheese, and someone even said asphalt. And of course, marine exhausts are often jacketed. But I would say the most common use for this stuff, especially in the food and beverage industry, is for chocolate. And that's exactly what this pipe is being built for. I've done some work for Hershey, for M&M Mars, and a couple Wilbur chocolate locations. And they all use a similar style jacketed piping like this. So the chocolate tanks themselves are usually in a very hot room above 110 degrees. And any piping in the hot rooms doesn't need to be jacketed. Those rooms are no fun to work in, but once the pipes leave the hot room, it all needs to be jacketed. Otherwise the chocolate would freeze up in the lines and the pumps would not be able to push it out to production. In some older plants, heat trace is used instead, but that doesn't transfer heat as evenly and is a pain to troubleshoot. These are the 304 half couplings we're gonna weld on for the hose jumpers to connect, and that will jump the hot water from one piece to the next on down the line. When he gets these couplings tacked on, he'll be able to weld the entire jacket. However, he will need to purge the jacket and the three inch at the same time when he welds the jacket ring to the three inch tube.
He's gonna use this polyflow to purge everything. He'll plug his purge hose into one of these brass fittings. The other one will be used for a purge exhaust. And this T is going to split the argon between the jacket chamber and the three inch tubing. If you work around food production, you know that piping is usually CIP'd or clean in place with a chemical solution after every batch. That is not the case with chocolate. And I believe that's because the oils from the chocolate wouldn't mix well with the CIP solution. Instead, they run what's called a pig or a bullet through the line. Using compressed air, they shoot it through and it pushes all the excess chocolate out the end of the line. This guy here is called a pig catcher. There's one of these at the end of each line and that bar there is what stops the pig. Once all the excess chocolate's been pushed out and the pig is at the end of the line, the operator can then open this guy up and pull the pig out and get ready to run the next batch. When welding the ring onto the tube, you want to keep a nice small bead with low heat. Otherwise, you risk warping that ferrule and the tri-clamp won't get a good seal. Corey's got foil tape stuck on the end of that tube to keep the purge in. We often use foil tape while purging. It's pretty heat resistant. I'll link that in the description also. Now he's moving on to the outside corner weld joint. It might be the trickiest weld on this piece. Because you're walking the cup right on the edge, it's pretty easy to slip off. He's running about 55 on the old Maxstar 150 STL. Purge gas set to about 12 CFH. Torch gas set between 20 and 30. Plenty of material here. It's just a low pressure water jacket. So there's no need to add wire, just a fusion weld. He's moving right along. And whoops, that's exactly what I was talking about. He just slipped off the edge. And honestly, he probably thought I was going to edit that out, but he thought wrong. So what if you need to jacket a T-fitting? A three inch T does not fit inside a four inch T. So we end up splitting the bigger T in half long ways. We put it around the smaller T and weld it back together. And right there you can see the seam where it was welded back together. So this is what makes a good sanitary weld. It's all about the inside. There's no cracks, crevices, oxidation, or major discoloration. It's fully penetrated with no skippers. There's nowhere for food to get hung up and nothing that will corrode over time. You can see right behind the weld, there's a few heat spots from where he welded the jacket to the tubing, which is fine because he didn't penetrate it. But even if he did, it would have been okay because it was under a purge. This is a weld made with no back purge at all, just to show what the oxidation looks like. That oxidation is referred to as sugar in the field. And that's why you always wanna purge stainless steel with inert gas, otherwise the molten metal reacts to the oxygen. 
Now we've got some nice consistent TIG welds and they're not too dark or charred, meaning too hot. Definitely wanna clean all the color off your stainless welds. That's gonna be the next step here. I'm gonna link a lot of the consumables we use down below. I also put my storefront down there so you can take a look at all the tools and equipment that I use on a daily basis if you're interested. And if you watched this far, you'd probably enjoy a few of the other videos that I made. I made a full length video just on sanitary welding and a video dedicated to purging stainless pipes and a few other piping videos as well. If you hated this video, be sure to not subscribe. That's the best way to let me know to stop making this content. And now that she's all cleaned up, she'll get pressure tested and then washed and then swabbed by QA before being installed and pushing some chocolate. Thanks for watching. See you soon.